Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. My name is Mike and uh, I like baseball cards, I especially like old baseball cards, but I like the whole hobby. And today I want to talk about something. Uh, it's going to be just me today. First of all, happy belated Thanksgiving to everybody. I know I took last week off. I hope there wasn't an episode last week. I hope that uh, you had a great time with your family and friends and ate till you puked. <laughs> it's always the, the gluttony that happens during Thanksgiving and the holidays is interesting to observe and, and great to partake in uh, if that's your thing. But today's episode is going to be kind of retrospective for me, introspective maybe is a better word, uh, for me to just talk about a little bit about my journey. And, and the reason I want to do that is a lot of times for you guys listening on podcast, you may not know on YouTube, the community uh, does a great job supporting each other. And so when a certain channel reaches a milestone of, of subscribers or views or whatever, uh, they, they typically will, will run some kind of contest. And that contest usually involves a challenge of some kind to Tell about your favorite card or talk about your favorite set or, you know, pick your thing. There's all kinds of different ones that happen on here on YouTube. And it, it's great because you get to hear so many different perspectives. You get to hear your friends talk about things. And it, th this recent one that, that I'm, this is kind of a participation in it, but really it's just more of a, it was a idea spur in my brain to talk about this because I have told throughout the two plus years that I've been doing this podcast, my story in bits and pieces along the way. My dad's been on the show. I've talked about players that I love and why I collect what I collect, but I haven't really brought it all home and told it in one fail swoop. And I think my story might echo a lot of people's stories out there. My collecting journey might look very similar to some of yours. It might be different. Uh, nobody does the exact same hobby. We all hobby a little bit differently. We all buy different things and like different things for various reasons. I have my things that I like. And But what I have seen and observed through the hundreds and hundreds of collectors that I know, the stories that I've heard, is there's kind of a, an evolution of a collector. We evolve as collectors from doing one thing to doing another. It's certainly in no means an exclusive statement. It doesn't include everyone. I know older people, older gentlemen, older ladies that, that love collecting new stuff. And I know young people that love collecting vintage. So it, it's certainly not you know, universal that people follow this pattern, but there is a pattern that I'm going to share with my story that you might be able to resonate with part or all of it. And it starts for me as a eight-year-old kid in 1981 when I started opening packs. And I remember opening Donruss and Fleer in particular. That was the first year of those products. Fleer and, and Donruss came out to challenge tops and on their kind of monopoly in the sports card world, the baseball card world in particular. And I just remember that year because I would lay cards out on my floor and and stack them up and put them in shoe boxes and rubber band them and all the things you would never do with cards today. Uh, I did out of being naive or ignorant or whatever. 
You just didn't think about all this stuff. You just wanted the cards. And throughout my childhood, I would buy cards anytime I could see them. When my dad would take me to flea markets, I would look for people that had sports cards and I would go to shops and all that. And I could never, even though I always loved the vintage cards, I could never really afford them. That was not in my budget as a young man, but it didn't mean they didn't. I, I saw a mantle or, you know, maze cards and errands. And I'd say, oh my gosh, or Ruth's or whatever. And I always thought, man, someday I'd love to own these cards. Never thinking that it would actually happen. Never really knowing even as a kid that I would still be collecting now at 49 years old. Um, I had no idea what that journey would look like for me. And that's kind of the fun of it. Honestly, I don't know what the next 10 or 15, 20 years for my collecting journey is going to look like. I have an idea today of what it might look like, but I don't really know. Um, it's, I will tell you that it is true that even after 40 plus years of doing this, I, I love the hobby now more than ever. And it's not even about the cards. It's about the people. And you hear me talk about this all the time because it's a common theme when I have guests on or whoever, uh, that it, the people make the hobby so much better. The friends, the fellow collectors, etc. It, it brings a, a level of joy that is indescribable. So as a kid, as I'm collecting these players, and this is part of the evolution, I started like everyone else does, like kids do today mostly, is collecting players that I watched. And so for me, it was the, you know, I loved the early 80s Rangers, the Texas Rangers. I was a Buddy Bell, Jim Sunberg, uh, Pete O'Brien, and uh, all these things. And then Nolan Ryan came to the Rangers in 1989, and I, my world was blown away. I'm like, holy moly, we have a, a legend in our midst. And we got to see him pitch uh, all the way through 94, which is insane. You know, he may have pit, right? If you've seen the Facing Nolan documentary, which, oh, by the way, if you haven't, highly suggest it very very good you'll you'll have if you don't come away from that with a tremendous amount of respect for nolan ryan uh i don't know what to tell you it, it's if you already had respect for him you'll it that'll be amped up even further because it's just a great documentary but he came to the rangers thinking he might pitch one or maybe two seasons at the most he was kind of like well i'll just keep doing it kind of till my arm falls off and pretty much he did but those Rangers teams were terrible. You know, we weren't any good, but I didn't care. I just, I, I wanted to collect the players that I saw on television that I heard on the ra about on the radio and all of these things. And so that's kind of the, I think that first stage as a collector is, is you're collecting players you know about that you literally can observe, have a instant connection with. And throughout my childhood, throughout my young adult life, I would absorb and read anything about baseball. I wanted all of it. I wanted to just read and read and read and read and read about the stories of yesteryear, about the legendary heroics of Mickey Mantle and Hank Aaron and Willie Mays and all these guys and Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb and Shoeless Joe Jackson and pick your guy. All of it was fascinating to me. All of it was uh, just diving into these myths of players and, and knowing all the numbers, you know, the 56 means Joe DiMaggio's hitting streak and, you know, 406 meant Ted Williams batting average in 1941 and 715 was a, or seven, uh, 755 was a historic number. Hank Aaron career home runs 714, which was uh, Babe Ruth's uh, number or home run total for his career. 61 by Roger Maris. All these numbers had magic to them. They meant something in baseball. I think numbers in baseball mean more than any other sport. They just, they have a, uh, an aura about them that is different than other sports. And that was also special to me. And what I wanted to know all of those special numbers. I wanted to know all the things I used to memorize the top 10 all time home run hitters and in career home runs and 
and year by year. And, you know, I could tell you that, you know, Maris hit 61, Ruth hit 60, uh, Jimmy Fox, Hank Greenberg, these guys that hit, you know, 58 or whatever. So it, the idea of 70 home runs was just unfathomable. Uh, that came to fruition in 98 with Mark McGuire, later broken by Barry Bonds, of course. But so th that childhood, that stage of going and buying players that I could see and through the mid 80s, and it was Alvin Davis and, and Don Mattingly. And then you had Jose Canseco and that whole craze and uh, all those late Griffey, you know, uh, Maddox just amazing players coming up McGuire, all these guys that was a, a my childhood was those guys becoming amazing players in the major leagues and so i wanted those guys i wanted to collect those guys and early on i became i, I converted from buying everything of current players to focusing on a player and I became a player collector. I first fell in love with Daryl Strawberry, not because he was a Texas Ranger. He wasn't. He was a New York Met. But I watched him play, and I thought, man, this guy is really good. He was Rookie of the Year in 83. Uh, he led the Mets, a huge part of their team, in the 86 World Series. So as I watched this guy, I'm like, I want to collect that guy. And it was because I thought his trajectory was a Hall of Fame type trajectory. And if I can buy his cards now, everything I can find that was it was enticing to me. And so as a as a player collector, I think maybe even just as a collector, we have this innate desire to be completionists. To me, it wasn't I just wanted some Daryl Strawberry cards. I wanted every Daryl Strawberry card. And not just different ones, but I wanted, you know, if I had 300 1990 upper deck Daryl Strawberries, great. You know, I didn't care. I, every one of them I saw, I, I tried to buy. And that was going, at that time, it was different because there was no eBay. Uh, you could do mail order cards, but I never did any of that. You know, I'm getting my Beckett every month and I'm looking at the new issues and how many Daryl Strawberry cards are in the new sets? Are there league leader cards or you know, superstar or all-star, whatever, all that stuff. I was like, oh, eagerly anticipating the next release so that I could figure out how many more Daryl Strawberry cards I would get to add to my collection. And as this player collector developed, I just kept buying and buying. Strawberry's career continued um, into the 90s. He gets traded to the Dodgers and or free agent to the Dodgers, whatever it was. And then a, a young ranger came along. And his name was Juan Gonzalez and he won home run titles in 92 and 93, you know, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this dude can hit. And we also had a young catcher come up in 91, Yvonne Rodriguez. And man, this guy had a cannon for an arm. And, and so it's, it's a morph of the collecting current players to a morph of collecting your favorite players. For me, this was my journey, right? And so I focused on these guys and I bought as many of their cards as I could. I became a Juan Gonzalez super collector. I kind of abandoned Daryl Strawberry. It wasn't, it was a, it was a slow burn, I guess, to, to get away from Daryl. I would still buy stuff every once in a while. And it just became harder and harder. I think we all as collectors in, encounter roadblocks at some point where we're going, I can't find anything else new and I'm tired of buying whatever same old stuff that I already have a ton of. And oh, by the way, I still have all my Daryl Strawberry cards. And I became a Juan Gonzalez guy. Started focus on him. Okay, new new player. He seemed to be in every set, every subset, every insert set you could think of because he was that good. He ended up winning MVPs in 96 and 98. Uh, Pudge won in 99. So you had these great Ranger players. Again, little did any of us know at that time that steroids was a thing. This is happening, you know, mid nineties. I'm in college at this point, still collecting when I can. I had local card shops where I was in Colorado and uh, it was great. You know, I'd go, I could, again, my budget was tiny because I was a poor college student, but I would still go and try to find cards and try to find deals and get good, cool stuff. Still always in the back of my mind, the idea of vintage and, and wanting to collect the greats of the game. 
was there. It was percolating. But the reality was I still couldn't afford it. I was still at a stage of life where, um, which is part of the evolution of a collector. You, you're forced into certain things, I think, because of just your circumstances. And so I was, as much as I wanted to own all that other old stuff, I couldn't. And so I was forced just by, again, by happenstance to have to buy current players. And so I did. And I was a Juan Gonzalez super collector. I had... At one point, we literally had a website. There were a few of us that created this website with a Juan Gonzalez checklist, and it was amazing. And so I met some other Juan Gonzalez guys, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I thought I had a lot of cards, you know, and, and these guys had other stuff. And we would trade with each other and help each other out. And this was, again, pre-YouTube, pre-all of this stuff. And I would, uh, I was 4,000, 4,200, 4,300 different Juan Gonzalez cards at one point, which is, again... The fled, this is fledgling eBay. So eBay is, you know, I, I joined eBay in 1998. And uh, actually, my username, even to this day on eBay, is Gonzalez Nut. So I was a Juan Gonzalez Nut. And so I'm Gonzalez Nut. Um, that's why that moniker sticks with me because I never forgot how huge of a Juan Gonzalez collector I was. Then I had a opportunity a guy another Juan Gonzalez super collector offered you know to buy me out basically to buy all of them and he offered me a number that I could not pass on uh because I had I don't know 30 or 40 one of ones and all kinds of cool stuff full printing plate sets and you know all four colors of printing plate sets you name it and back then that was a lot harder to do than it is today uh and so I sold all of my Juan Gonzalez cards to one guy and then I started focusing on Pudge and Pudge was my guy uh, really mid um, 2000s, like, you know, early 2000s through the mid 2000s, I would buy Pudge cards. And that was a time when when my collecting was also diminished uh, by circumstance because I was freshly out of college. I was relatively new in my career i was newly married young kids there was no you know discretionary funds those didn't exist really and so it was the occasional buy the occasional box that my mom would buy me at christmas or you know a gift card on ebay or things like that when i could pick our cards up so i would pick stuff up but it was again relatively muted someday i need to show my pudge collection because i still have it and uh, it's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, I think I have a hundred and something Pudge autographs, and uh, just now he's a Hall of Famer, which is great. Which will lead me to my point of this. I know I'm really rambling here, but you're, you're getting the whole deal today. Uh, at, at that point, I watched. I love the All Star Game. It's one of my favorite summer events, the Mid Midsummer Classic, and I love the Home Run Derby. And so I was watching the home run derby in 2008 at Yankee stadium. And this guy um, named Josh Hamilton, Texas Ranger came up and hit balls like I've never seen before. He did things. And, and that night, that very night I went and bought a Josh Hamilton Jersey online. I uh, became instantly a Josh Hamilton super collector. And I started buying stuff up from, you know, I think his first cards were in 07 with uh, the Reds and then started having cards with the Rangers and just, he, he was amazing. And he, his story was also very cool to me. Uh, you know, his amazing talent, number one draft pick overall to the Rays, becomes a drug addict, uh, you know, finds finds Christianity reach, you know, turns his life around, decides to get back into baseball, still is an amazing talent, still is an amazing player and makes a return to major league baseball, you know, five-time all-star five years in a row. I think actually won a batting title, an MVP. Like there was a period of time when he was the best player on the planet. And this is pre trout right before trout came up onto the scene. And so I was a Josh Hamilton super clicker. I still have all of those as well. Kind of abandoned Pudge, not completely, but again, more focused on Hamilton, bought so much stuff. And that was at a time when my card budget was really starting to expand as well. So I was able to buy a lot of stuff. Um, I have thousands and thousands of Josh Hamilton cards. 
And then when Josh Hamilton took his turn, he went to the Angels. That really kind of pissed me off. And then I'm like, he, he his career really. I, at first, I was like, okay, I'm going to follow him to the Angels because as a super collector, I really liked him wearing my team's jersey. But at the same time, do, do I care more about the team or the player? And the answer is both. And so I still collected Josh Hamilton for a little while. His, his career fizzled. And I'm like looking around going, good grief. I have all of these Josh Hamilton cards. I have tens of thousands of dollars invested into this player. And I looked back at my player collecting career of – Daryl Strawberry, great player, you know, good player, had a great career, not a Hall of Famer. Juan Gonzalez, great player, great career, not a Hall of Famer. Um, Devon Rodriguez, yep, okay, good, good choice there. And then Josh Hamilton, not a good choice. And I think about the cumulative amount of money I spent on that. And I had fun with it. I'm not trying to say I didn't. I enjoyed collecting those guys and hunting for the different cards. But at the end of the day, you look around and you go, really? That's not probably the best thing um, long term. If I if I want to be in this hobby long term, I can't keep picking players that end up fizzling out or or being, you know, has-beens and that kind of thing instead of all-time great. So that's when I made the decision to say, all right, I'm going to evolve from, again, stage one, I was a just buy anything, buy everything, current players, everything new to focusing on different players. And then finally going, okay, if I'm going to do this and I really want to have a collection that I can enjoy a long, long time, then I'm going to start collecting hall of famer stuff. And so I, I graduated to vintage. I finally started my PhD program in the hobby and going, okay, I'm, I'm now, going for all of this. And it was just a learning experience. It was like, man, I knew all the sets. I knew all the, all the cards, but I wanted to learn even more. I wanted to learn about the quirky stuff about what some people call the oddball kind of things. I wanted all, I wanted just to learn. I wanted to be a sponge in the vintage world. And so I started, you know, small, I started saying, okay, let me just go back to 73 and try to collect all the hall of famers from that set. And actually I missed a huge part of it. And I thought, let me, let me say this. I was at a point when I started reading uh, or I discovered Mike Payne's book, the 300 great cards of the 20th century scoff. If you want, um, it, you look at some of the cards in that checklist of 300 cards. And you're like, why is this card in here? But the reality is most of the cards in there are pretty great. And it's key rookie cards and great cards of Hall of Famers and all this awesome stuff. So the reality was that was attractive to me in a way to go, okay, I want to have a project. This is a great project. And so I said, I'm going to start at 1960. I'm not even going to try to do 50s cards, 40s cards, 30s cards, pre-war stuff. I'm not even going to go down that road. I'm just going to do 60 and beyond because I did want to stretch my hobby dollar as much as I could. And so I said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to tackle that. And there happened to be 150 cards post 1960 and 150 cards in that 300 great cards pre 1960. So it, we're like, okay, I can do half of it. Let's try to do half of it. That sounds like an achievable goal as a collector. Cause again, I'm a completionist, right? So if, if I don't want to start down something, if I'm not going to try to be all in on the idea and doesn't mean you can't, as a collector, change your mind down the road. Uh, people do it all. We do it all the time as collectors. But for me, I wanted something I could do for a long time. I thought it would be a, a, a long-term project that I could just enjoy and, you know, fill in the holes as we go. So I start picking up cards and I buy them raw at first. I, in fact, I thought grading was a complete idiocy when I was starting it to get into vintage. I'm like, and grading had been around since you know 91 or whatever 92 got really big in the nine late 90s early 2000s and i'm like man that's just dumb who cares you know just buy the card and it was because i was a player collector and so it just didn't matter and i had some josh hamilton stuff especially that was you know graded and all that but you know around 2010 2011 when i started getting into vintage again i said you know started buying some cards and I thought, okay, some of these cards are getting a little pricey. 
I don't know that I have enough vintage knowledge yet to discern a real card from a fake card. I'd, I'd like to think that I could, but I, I can get duped. I've been duped plenty of times in my hobby life, just probably like a lot of us, we've all made mistakes in this hobby and hopefully learned from them. And so I said, you know what, at least from a authenticity standpoint, I'm going to start buying graded cards. Uh, I want to buy already graded cards and PSA at the time was from post 1960. They were the company that did that. They were the ones that were the best known for that era, for that vintage era, that golden age era that we're talking about. And so I started buying PSA cards and then I discovered, discovered the set registry. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. There's all these cool sets. You can pretty much think of any set that you can create, you know, greatest all time New York Mets and there's a set for it. And uh, like how cool, and it's, it's pseudo competition with other people and, and how great is that? And so I could see where I ranked and I could, it, it was a checklist for me too. I could see how much I had completed and what cards I still needed and all this different stuff. I did have my own spreadsheet as well, but it was just a set. It was kind of a backup, like a secondary, a redundant system, so to speak for my collection. And so as I go down that road, it was just like, Whoa. And then I discovered, Oh, I could, then I started doing, I was like, let's, what if I did all the Hall of Famers from one set? Let's do 73. That's my birth year. Let's that'd be fun. That'd be great. Lots of great players in 73. So you still had Maze and Aaron's card. You have Clemente's last card. Tons of great cards in 73. So I start buying up 73 tops Hall of Famers and I get that done. I'm like, well, what's the next one I can do? And I did 1960 and I started working on 1960. And what's great is when you look at those sets in my collection, especially the 60 top set, I have a lot of, I'll call them higher grades, you know, sixes, sevens, even some eights in that set. Because back then, again, we're talking, oh, eight, seven, eight years ago when I really started getting into that stuff, then you could, cards were much cheaper than they are today, uh, especially in the higher grades. And especially kind of the, you know, who wants an eighth year Fergie Jenkins card, you know, it's cheap. Uh, that's changed quite a bit. So I started doing these select years and then I said, okay, what's a project I could, I got done with them and I'm like, okay, now what, which is how we do, right? It's collectors. It's like, what's next. And I said, why don't I do the whole decade and not just one decade, let's do the 70s 80s and then or 60s 70s and the 80s and do all the hall of famers why not let's do that that sounds like a good idea and so i started buying up those kind of cards uh all the while still working on the 300 great cards and i realized how much overlap there was between different sets and different registries and that was appealing to me to and i said well why not get all the hall of fame rookie cards well that would be encompassed in you know, post-war Hall of Fame rookie set registry, that would be encompassed in most of these decades. Ah, but the 50s, you know, there's a lot of great 50s rookies and even some late 40s stuff. So maybe I just do the 50s too. <laughs> and it became the four decade set, you know, um, to try to collect every Hall of Famer on a Thompson Bowman card within each of those decades every year. Uh, whether it's, and I, and I try to do base cards, obviously, of course, uh, league leader cards, managers, umpires, because there's umpires in 55 Bowman. So anything that has that pictures a Hall of Famer, I want to have it. And 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 that created the five decade set or the four decade set. Sorry, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I really I've been really good about sticking with at 1989. Um, I'm a child of the 80s, so I love the 80s cards. But past that, I was like, okay, you, you have to have a point where you stop and as a point of example the four decade set i'm going to pull it up here on my master gigantic spreadsheet with 300 tabs you hear me click uh to get to the tab that i need that has that four decade set on it there are within those four decades uh 2456 cards so you're talking about almost 2500 cards uh, I have almost 2,000 of them already. I'm at 1992, so I'm 81% complete with that project. 
ironically the extra 400 cards i need are, are some big ones uh but i've evolved that collector evolution that evolving from current players to player collector to vintage collector i don't think that's an unusual story again it's not absolute uh but it's definitely i think there are people that go you know what i think vintage is a good way to go it's it's like you learn uh, i want to say learn your lesson but you can enjoy new cards just as much i just opened some boxes of brand new stuff uh today so it's not that you can't enjoy the new stuff but i had a deeper appreciation for the older stuff for the vintage stuff it just it meant more to me it just felt better to buy those cards i felt like i wasn't wasting my money again that's very personal opinion very personal feeling uh you certainly don't have to share that but i felt like man i can buy these cards and they're not really gonna do a whole lot value wise in terms of terminal value they're, they might go down a little bit but they're gonna people will want these cards for a really long time they're not going to want josh hamilton's and daryl strawberries in the same way that you want hank aaron and mickey mantles it's just true in the hobby that's just a reality and so that was just a that evolution that i experienced during my hobby journey and i'm still doing it today i love it i absolutely love it i love hunting for the cards i love going through the beast and looking at all the different cards that i have in any given year and decade and whatnot it is i i get a great sense of satisfaction from my collection in that manner and the value part of it is just an ancillary benefit yay i'm glad they're worth more or i'm glad they're holding their value that's just good that just feels good too to know that to know that i'm not these are guys you know they can't tear an acl they can't you know uh need tommy john surgery or whatever none of that their, their careers are finished their story has been told and that that helps you know that helps me feel good about it uh, because it does take a lot of time. It does take a lot of money to build a collection. And the th one theme I want you to hear as I've told this story over the last half hour is that it's taken me a really long time to get here. I hear people compliment me and I appreciate it on, you know, oh my gosh, you have an amazing collection. Well, A, there's always someone with a better collection. I know plenty of guys that have better collections than I do. And that's fine. I'll get there someday. And it just, it takes tremendous patience. It takes tremendous patience and you, and you have to have a drive, maybe not the, the right word, but persistence and, and dedication to what you're doing to stick with it, right? For, for decades. And it, it may take decades for you to build the collection that you ultimately want. Okay. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Who cares how long it takes? Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the, the, the hunt. All of that stuff plays into when you get to the end of it, like, wow, that was, that was fun, right? That, that, that was meaningful in my life cards and this hobby and you guys are a meaningful part of my life. It's hard to separate. I get, you know, it's almost like people just Mike baseball collector, baseball collector, Mike, you know, that's kind of just what I'm known as in my real life. I'm not obviously, but in my hobby life, it's, it's a huge part of my overall life. And I have great support from my wife and my kids. Uh, tolerated is probably a right word. Uh, but it is, it's, it's brought me so much joy. My journey is not unique, but it is my journey. Uh, your journey is awesome too. Whatever that is that you're on, uh, enjoy it, you know, share it with other people share it with the community, share it with somebody, because that just adds it. Like I said earlier, a, a great layer of awesomeness to this hobby. So that is my journey. Um, the, the original collection or question was, why do you collect what you collect? And, and the why, the biggest why for me, why do I collect the way I collect is um, I love the history of the game. I love learning about new things and, and collecting greats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've started my annual once a year watching the baseball documentary by Ken Burns. I do that during the off season, usually starting in December, because I, I typically take some time off and I'll have time where it's 
dead time, so to speak, when Julie's not around and we're not doing family stuff and I can just stick on an episode and watch it. And ultimately through the off season, I'll end up watching the entire series again for probably the 10th, 12th time. I don't know. Never get tired of it. Always learn something from it. And so I, and whenever I watch it, every time I watch it, I go, Oh, I want to go get a card of that guy. Cause that is awesome. Great story. Great connection. You know, that's what vintage means to me. That's why I collect vintage now. That's why I do it. Um, so that was a long ramble for me. Uh, if you're still here, I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have a more regular episode next week. A uh, good friend of mine's coming on named Chris, and we will talk more vintage and talk more practical stuff. And hopefully you guys enjoyed this. You know, let me know what you think down below. Comment, please. Uh, if you're listening on podcast, you can uh, send me a direct message. Uh, my podcast username is Baseball Collector Mike. Would love to hear from you. Would love to get feedback all the time. I appreciate it. Uh, all the well wishes that people send is great and encouragement. It really means a lot to me. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week for another episode. Keep collecting.